So the way that uh, Liz and Andre would like to do it is uh, Liz will start out and describe the project. Am I right, Liz? We'll see. <laughs> and then, and then uh, uh, Andre will speak. Liz will speak. They'll 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 uh, kick it back and forth for a few rounds in order to introduce the topic for about forty five minutes, and then we will. Uh, look at your comments and questions, which you are invited to submit um, on the comment section on Facebook. Put your questions in there, and we have a staff member of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute who's going to uh, uh, curate those questions and send them along to me so that I can ask them on your behalf. Just one final note is to say that this event is part of a series that the Weatherhead East Asian Institute has been uh, doing uh, on issues related to COVID-19 in Asia. We've had an event on China, Taiwan, Japan, uh, two events on uh, Japan, two on China. So, this is a series, and if you would go on the Weatherhead East Asian Institute website, you'll find all of those events which have been recorded and you'd be able to watch any of them that you missed. So with that, I will introduce Liz and I will mute myself. Hi, Liz. Hi, thank you so much, Andy, for that introduction and to the Weatherhead East Asian Institute for hosting this event. Um, one of the, the uh, upsides of this uh, COVID lockdown we've all been in is having the opportunity to sit and reflect about the international implications. And this project was partly inspired by a series of talks, uh, one at, the, at Weatherhead that Andy was a participant in about Taiwan and COVID and the other that Andre was uh, participating in at GW about Estonia and COVID, and that helps um, inspire my thinking and um, informs my uh, comments to you today. Um, so, as Andy mentioned, uh, the, it's perhaps an unexpected choice of countries to bring together in our discussion, but this isn't a random selection of two small uh, democracies on. Uh, opposite ends of the globe. Uh, there, are, They actually have many parallels in terms of the complex geopolitics that they confront, their high degree of digitalization, and uh, most importantly for our topic today, their successful response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So first, uh, looking at their geopolitical situation, these are two small democracies on the peripheries of large states. Uh, that have contested and still contest their sovereignty uh, with broader international implications. As you all know, uh, the PRC claims Taiwan as a renegade province, and a 2005 law gives it the right to retake the island by force should it declare independence. Uh, there are identity issues at stake here. Uh, while 95% of Taiwan's population is Han Chinese, 83% uh, of citizens on the island identified as Taiwanese in a February 2020 poll, with just 5.3% in this poll identifying as Chinese and 6.7% as both. Uh, so, so there's been a shift in self-perceptions that has exacerbated this contested sovereignty issue. And to make things even more uh, interesting and dangerous. Uh, the U.S. is committed by law to Taiwan's defense, and the U.S. and China, of course, are in a tense state of relations. Um, Estonia has some similar geopolitical considerations. It was a part of the Russian Empire until 1918, then independent until 1939 when the Soviet Union occupied it. Um, the Estonian parliament declared sovereignty in 1988, and the country became fully independent for the second time after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, though troops were not withdrawn 
fully until 1994. And 25% of the population of Estonia is Russian. Um, Estonia joined the EU and NATO in 2004. And so they, they have similar considerations in terms of the geopolitical environment that they confront, um, the contested sovereignty and identity issues, and uh, the international alliances that exacerbate all of these. Uh, also, another commonality is that both are highly wired and face cyber threats. So Estonia is known as one of the most digitalized countries in the world. And um, in May of 2007, May, May 9th, 2007, Estonia faced a massive DNS denial of service attack originating in Russia, which incapacitated the country's ATMs, media and government websites for about two weeks. And this was in response to um, Estonia's uh, removal of a statue commemorating uh, Soviet victory over the Nazis and the, and the war dead um, from the central square to another place. At the time, the Estonian Minister of Defense considered invoking NATO's Article 5, the collective defense article, since Estonia had been a member of NATO by that time, but eventually rejected this because of the relatively limited scope and consequences of this attack. But, that, but Estonia has not ruled out invoking that in future, if future attacks occur. Similarly, Taiwan has faced cyber threats from its big neighbor, uh, the PRC, since 1999, when hackers attacked government websites in response to President, former President Li Donghui's interview where he suggested that Taiwan and China have a special state-to-state -state relationship and should negotiate on that, that, on that basis. And so Taiwan is uniquely vulnerable to cyber attacks. And, um, and it raises the question, would the international community consider a devastating cyber attack on Taiwan an attack? And this is complicated further by the US policy of strategic ambiguity, where it's unclear what the red lines would be for a US, uh, US defense of Taiwan. And of course, uh, both Estonia and Taiwan face um, disinformation um, efforts, which they need to address. Um, on the positive side, they both have used digital tools to successfully combat COVID-19, which Andre and I will discuss in our presentation. Uh, just to give you their facts on this, Estonia has a small population, 1.3 million people, and had only 2,174 cases and 63 deaths. Taiwan's record is even better, um, had, with a population of 23.7 million people, only registered 481 cases and seven deaths. Um, and so we're going to address in our presentation some conventional wisdom about geopolitics and about uh, the role of regime type in addressing a pandemic. Um, the conventional wisdom is that geopolitics is still a defining factor even in the globalized world and that large states like the PRC and Russia continue to dominate cyberspace. And it's true that because of their geopolitical positioning, Estonia and Taiwan rely on digital technologies that make them very vulnerable to this. But we argue that there's another side and that is the digital power that these two small democracies have at their disposal. A second conventional wisdom we often hear is that um, either authoritarian regimes are better at or more effective at addressing pandemics or that regime type doesn't matter as, as long as certain types of pandemic responses are used. And so we examine the, the democratic digital tools that these two have employed to good effect and show that these tools emerged out of their democratic conditions and also serve to consolidate social consensus. And we also argue that these digital tools, these democratic digital tools, serve to enhance their sovereignty, although there have been some uh, challenges uh, in the geopolitical sphere that remain and some pushback in terms of the privacy implications. So I'm going to hand it over to Andre now. 
Uh, thank you very much. And of course, uh, I should start with uh, my thanks to uh, Lise and to Andy for inviting me to this very interesting, very timely uh, talk. So in my uh, kickoff uh, statement, I will just very briefly try to uh, open up the concept of digital power for our discussion, because this is the key concept that uh, is important for our exercise in uh, uh, juxtaposing and comparing uh, these two countries, Estonia and uh, Taiwan. And of course, I'm not uh, going to over-theorize, but still I think a couple of points might be important for our discussion. And one of them is that there are two different, uh, two, two sides in this uh, digital power coin. One side is that digital power is a power of nation states. That's what we know. Uh, and in this sense, it shares a lot with some other traditional forms of uh, power, including geopower or geopolitics that stem from that. But on the other hand, uh, it's a new type of power. And it's new not only because of technology, but also because of its political, uh, political function. And this political function is about making uh, all factors related to geopolitics a little bit more relative, including the size of uh, countries and the territorial locations, advantages and disadvantages, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's exactly the second uh, side of the coin that uh, opens up uh, more political spaces for smaller countries uh, that otherwise could have been ignored or disregarded or not taken into due account. But as soon as we discuss uh, their actorship in terms of uh, uh, digital power, they are important. So in this sense, uh, uh, this uh, uh, digitalization uh, somehow redefines the notion or the notions of uh, strengths and uh, weaknesses in international relations, again, opening up new operational opportunities for, uh, uh, for smaller uh, countries. That's uh, the first important point. The second important point is to see how digital power might be related to geopolitics or geopower, which Liz already mentioned uh, in uh, her introductory statement, and uh, with something that we would like to add to this picture because of COVID-19, and this is uh, biopower or biopolitics. So when it comes to geopolitics, I think it's also, there is also some kind of ambiguity here. On the one hand, uh, we all know that uh, due to uh, globalization in the 21st century, uh, the geographical basis of power is losing its, uh, its importance because uh, it's not necessarily states uh, that uh, stand uh, behind the security challenges and it's not necessarily governments that are first responders to these security challenges. Plus, uh, we know that low-cost technologies, uh, technologies make them available to non-state actors. Plus, we know that there is a debate on uh, human as opposed to state-centric uh, perspectives of uh, cybersecurity and digitalization, etc. So all this leads us to what I would call post-national and post-sovereign type of politics. This is one part of the story. But another part of the story is that geopolitical vocabulary is still uh, important for discussing uh, digital power. For example, it's uh, very often that uh, states are measured uh, in certain, some kind of you know, rankings or uh, ratings in, in terms of their security, uh, cybersecurity capacity, for example. Or it's also quite often to read in international academic literature uh, about some kind of parallels between digital power and uh, let's say traditional uh, power politics. Uh, I think it was uh, Joseph Nye uh, who mentioned once uh, some kind of parallels between uh, regulating cyber domain and uh, negotiating nuclear deals. So he saw some kind of uh, some analogies and some uh, parallels. And uh, uh, there are also talks about uh, let's say the global west against uh, Eastern competitors, including Russia, China, and probably Iran, when it comes to uh, uh, cyber and digital uh, spheres with uh, uh, an important issue of some kind of a digital authoritarianism in, in cyberspace, uh, which is basically ascribed to 
non-Western uh, countries and their uh, understanding of what uh, dig digitalization and cyber power is about. So in this sense, the geopolitical characteristics are still important uh, element of our discussion about uh, cyber and about everything related to g g digital. Now, my last point, how the COVID how COVID-19 uh, contributed to uh, this uh, uh, this general picture. Well, I think, um, in academically speaking, the strongest uh, contribution was the revival of uh, interest to the concept of biopolitics because COVID-19 is about life and death. It's about human bodies as a central element of political uh, political agendas and political calculations. It's about different categorizations of human lives and human bodies. It's about uh, health diplomacy or global health uh, debate. So all this bio issue become uh, increasingly uh, politicized because of this state of exception and uh, the almost global lockdown that we've been uh, going uh, through all of us. But uh, what I would like to uh, underline that this is a very peculiar, very particular type of state of exception, not necessarily defined and driven by sovereign power only. This is a type of state of exception that requires and necessitates a very important contribution from the part of uh, different communities and uh, civil societies. For example, when it comes to the concept of digital way of life, a very biopolitical concept, it implies uh, the, you know, the necessity of people to acquire more digital skills to be able to take a better care about about their life, uh, lives and their, uh, their health. It also connotes other discussions on human capital, on uh, resilience, on sustainable development, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's what I'm going to continue uh, with, with, with the case of uh, Estonia. I think the idea of responsible behavior or what the French political philosopher Michel Foucault called responsabilization uh, plays increasingly important role in all efforts uh, concerning uh, all kind of measures, including technical measures against uh, against pandemic. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic also uh, uncovered many, I would say, I would call the digital vulnerabilities and uh, opened up the space uh, for uh, debates on such issues as, for example, social inequalities that might be uh, exaggerated uh, by COVID or social hierarchies. Uh, I also think that uh, uh, different imperfections in decision making when it comes to governance uh, are also important part of uh, of the debate, and that's exactly what I'm going to very briefly touch upon uh, in uh, the Estonian uh, part of my uh, my talk. Please. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is talk to you a little bit about Taiwan's digital power, and I'm going to highlight two different aspects of this digital power. And then I'll explain how this shaped Taiwan's response to COVID-19. And then Andre will return and talk about uh, the same issues with respect to Estonia. Uh, so Taiwan actually has two types of digital power that I would like to emphasize today. One is that it is a producer of digital power because of its role in the IT industry. Taiwan's semiconductor industry dominates globally. And uh, Taiwan's semiconductor manufacturing company, TMSC, is the world's leading producer of chips, which are central to global supply chains um, and to the US and the PRC in particular. This industry is also very significant for Taiwan's economy, accounting for 15% of its GDP. Um, and so here we see digital power as an as, as economic strength. Uh, at the same time, it also introduces some vulnerability because of the geopolitical 
environment in which Taiwan finds itself. And Taiwan is now caught in the middle between US-China tensions over trade and Huawei uh, development of 5G. Um, and Taiwan um, sells chips to both countries, but uh, the US imposed sanctions um, in May of 2020 on companies that would uh, sell, uh, continue to sell these chips to Huawei. And so TMSC had to halt these sales um, and is now investing in a plant in Arizona. Uh, also, Taiwan is trying to reduce its dependence on production in the mainland, which is now 70% for the, for the industry. Um, so, so it's a powerhouse in terms of the production of this technology, but faces a complicated geopolitical environment. The other side of, of uh, Taiwan's digital power um, is its digital democracy that has been evolving. And this is, this is not a response to COVID-19. This has been occurring since the late 1990s. Um, and the purpose has been to simplify government procedures for the citizens of the island through e-governance, but also to achieve greater social consensus, improve transparency in government, improve uh, participation and increasing accountability. And this is a sharp contrast to the surveillance state that has accompanied digitalization on the mainland. And because of all of these digital tools, Taiwan ranked fourth for innovation in the World Economic Forum's National Competitiveness, Competitiveness Survey in 2019. So this push for uh, greater, di greater digitalization occurred in response to some disasters in 1999, uh, where there's a severe power outage that incapacitated the northern half of the island in, uh, in 1999. And also the, the same year, a major earthquake. And so in Taiwan, there was discussion of how to ensure that infrastructure was better, telecommunications infrastructure was protected in the case of future disasters. And then that same year, we had uh, major hacking by the PRC in response to uh, the Lee Dongwei interview that I mentioned earlier. And so this led to a whole series of efforts uh, on the security side and then on the e-government side. So on the security side to create various institutions to deal with cyber threats, um, to uh, create departments within government agencies to manage these threats, a cyber command within the military, legislation to regulate all of these activities. Uh, um, in parallel to this, there was a, a pathway to e-government that began in 1998 in Taiwan. And Taiwan is now at the fifth stage of more than a 20 year effort to become what, the, what they call a smart power. And interestingly, I found out during this research is that Estonia was one of the models uh, for Taiwan in this, as was Singapore in developing a path to e-governance using cloud computing uh, for data, AI, and, and so on. Uh, but the other interesting part about this is that the, the concept is one of co-governance. So not just to create a better um, form of administration for government, in government agencies, but to allow the society for, to participate now, to participate more. Um, uh, I don't know, some of you may have heard the new uh, Taiwan's new representative to the US, uh, Ambassador um, Xiao speak yesterday at the Hudson Institute, and she spoke about the public-private partnership in the digital sphere in Taiwan. So this is this, this idea of co-governance. And this emerged um, more recently as a result of the Sunflower Movement in Taiwan in 2014, where you had so-called civic hackers who emerged, including the current digital minister of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, who is speaking at NBR next week. And they created a civic tech collective called uh, Gov Zero to expand public participation in uh, government decision making. Um, it's called Gov Zero because the idea is to change traditional government's thinking through digital thinking. And then one zero um, 
uh, corresponding to digital thinking, and to empower society to engage with government. Um, and uh, a final aspect of Taiwan's digitalization refers to efforts to combat disinformation that, that it has faced internally throughout uh, election campaigns and because of the relationship that has often been tense with the mainland. So this is the context in which uh, Taiwan encountered the COVID pandemic. And Taiwan did much better than ex people expected considering its proximity to the, to the epicenter, the origination of this, uh, of this um, pandemic, the fact that 2 million Taiwanese live on the mainland, and then there were 2.7 million travelers from the mainland to Taiwan in, in 2019. So double the population of Estonia traveled to Taiwan from, from uh, the mainland. And so many experts thought that Taiwan would be very hard hit by this pandemic, and that didn't work. That didn't happen happily for uh, two sets of reasons. Uh, the first set is often uh, is often uh, highlighted because of Taiwan's uh, experience with SARS in 2002, 2003. The administrative state was already well in place to address a pandemic. And Taiwanese have had a national health insurance since the mid 90s. And after SARS, a Central Epidemic Command Center was established and it was activated early on in response to COVID. Patient data had been start, stored in the cloud since 2018, and this made it easier to combine patient data with customs data to, to trace uh, travel histories and so on. And so I think. Um, this audience is probably aware of all of the steps that Taiwan took uh, in record time um, administratively to address the pandemic. What's less um, known is the role of society, in this issue of co-governance and the responsabilization that Andre talked about earlier, how, how individuals, companies, uh, social groups uh, took, in, took efforts uh, to work with the government to address this pandemic. And this was a key factor, and this involved individual citizens, mobile phone companies, uh, programmers, credit card companies, tour companies, uh, all of these efforts together to address uh, the pandemic. For example, one challenge was the docking of a cruise ship, the Diamond Princess in Jilong in Taiwan, and 3,000 people got off that ship and, and toured around Taiwan. And that could have been a disaster in terms of the spreading of the pandemic. But Taiwan was able to mobilize all of these different companies and uh, use big data to trace more than 600,000 contacts of these 3,000 people and avoid a big outbreak as a result. And in fact, Taiwan had no lockdown uh, because uh, uh, draconian measures are very sensitive in Taiwan due to the memories of the white terror uh, the authoritarian uh, suppression uh, from 1947 to 1987. Uh, and so government authorities are reluctant to take extreme steps. And so instead, people were asked to self-quarantine. And again, phone companies, data facilitated this. Uh, an intelligent electronic fence system was set up, a government effort that partnered with mobile carriers that use GPS to track people who self-quarantine. And if they, were, if they didn't respond uh, to um, text messages, then a police were sent to investigate. Also, tech collectives created uh, a mask buying app with government uh, co-participation that enabled people to find out where they could buy masks in their neighborhood. Because initially in Taiwan, like in the US and other countries, it was hard to find masks. And to avoid people wandering around without masks and having trouble to get them, they, did, they discovered this way of, of identifying where masks could be found and people could pre pay for them. And then finally, uh, there was an, also an effort to deal with the disinformation that Taiwan faced from PRC and other places, just like uh, other countries did. And, they, and uh, this tech, collect, 
tech collective um, Government Zero created a bot called uh, the Jendama bot. Jendama in Chinese means really? Are you kidding? And, and so if you face disinformation, you encounter disinformation online, you could report it to this bot, which would then uh, report, uh, further transfer this, this piece of information to other authorities who could investigate. And there were other government um, so society partnerships to investigate this information. So in addition to all of the government measures that Taiwan imposed because of its experience with SARS, society, individuals obeying quarantine, companies cooperating, tech, technical collectives all played a role taking uh, responsibility on themselves to work with government in, in this partnership to deal with the COVID situation. So now I'll turn the floor over to Andre and he'll can tell us about the Estonian case. Uh, okay, uh, so let me just uh, briefly uh, like, uh, describe uh, the Estonian uh, trajectory towards uh, its uh, well-advertised status of uh, uh, country uh, in which digital revolution uh, uh, has taken place. Um, and I would start with a kind of a metaphor. Uh, Estonian uh, digital story, to me, is a story of uh, sort of escape from geopolitics. And this is a very important point, because as Elise mentioned uh, some time ago, uh, the Russian uh, ex-Soviet troops have left uh, uh, the Estonian territory in 1994, but in 2007, uh, Estonia became, I think, the first uh, country, at least in this post-Soviet area, that was uh, cyber attacked by uh, Russia. And uh, from the Russian part, it was a kind of uh, uh, Russian uh, response to the relocation of a monument to uh, the Second World War uh, Soviet uh, uh, soldiers, which uh, legally speaking is a completely domestic affair of Estonia, but Russia clearly demonstrated its uh, kind of uh, right to interfere in cases when it comes to uh, the so-called common memory and the memory politics and the identity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a kind of a starting point that uh, made Estonia think uh, much more seriously about uh, uh, this disadvantages of its geopolitical location. And uh, that's exactly at this point that Estonia started investing uh, much more of uh, resources into digitalization and uh, its uh, cybersecurity uh, and creating a, a set of, or making a set of uh, steps towards uh, innovations and uh, this metaphor of a digital revolution exactly comes uh, from that. Estonia uh, declared uh, internet access one of basic human rights, uh, by the way. Uh, Estonia introduced as early as in, uh, I think, 2000 uh, digital signatures uh, that, uh, uh, of course, facilitated many, uh, you know, routine issues related to uh, let's say, everyday uh, necessities of uh, people when it comes to uh, banking or signing some uh, documents, uh, etc. And Estonia is proudly known as uh, the first country in the world to operate from the cloud. Uh, and as one of Estonian observers mentioned, if you run your country from, from the cloud, well, the cloud cannot be occupied. So again, you see this kind of, uh, uh, you know, geopolitical uh, meanings and geopolitical uh, references in uh, this digital uh, discourses on digital power. Estonia is uh, very well known for its e-residency uh, program that started a few years ago. Now, uh, in, uh, there are 58,000 uh, holders of Estonian e-residency. Uh, forming a kind of Estonian uh, global circle of friends in uh, uh, many, many countries. And this e-residency ID card uh, is helpful uh, for facilitating some kind of financial and business operation without physical presence in uh, Estonian or on Estonian territory. Uh, it also includes uh, 
trade, um, economic uh, transactions, etc. Estonia is known for its uh, very vibrant community of uh, start uh, startups. Those e-residents have established uh, 7,200 startups uh, with uh, 1,300 persons employed and uh, uh, 25 million euro uh, of uh, net revenues coming from uh, from that part of digital uh, digital economy, which again uh, uh, explains why. Uh, Estonia is proudly describing itself as a part of its nation branding uh, uh, discourse, uh, a new digital nation. Uh, Estonia has also introduced uh, a digital nomadic visa, uh, which is basically for uh, freelancers, including those who have part-time jobs uh, in uh, IT sector and in other sectors. Uh, all those who are what, temporarily employed, either by Estonian or North Estonian uh, employers, which is also considered as one of uh, innovative uh, solutions uh, in the field of uh, uh, mobility. Estonia was very close to introducing its uh, virtual currency, Estcoin, but its, uh, its future was decided by the EU Commission, and the EU Commission found it uh, not in... Uh, uh, let's say compliance with the European regulations, so the project was shelved. Uh, so uh, when it comes to uh, uh, you know this uh, kind of uh, uh, escape from geography or escape from uh, from geopolitics, Estonian government always uh, underlines and underscores that uh, its digital policy is more people centric than uh, territorial. And uh, this all led to a very interesting uh, experiment with uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, a project that is known as a data embassy, a huge server that uh, stores data about each Estonian uh, when it comes to taxes, when it comes to medical conditions and financial, uh, financial issues is located uh, beyond Estonian national borders. Uh, so when I teach a course on globalization, I always use this example as a kind of non-territorial or trans-territorial solution that again is motivated very much by uh, geopolitical vulnerability and geopolitical considerations. So uh, the, this server or this uh, uh, data center is located in Luxembourg. It basically means that even in the worst case scenario, uh, Estonian nation can be governed using these digital technologies and digital means. And I think this is, uh, this is an important illustration of this nexus of geopolitics and uh, uh, digital power. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, of course, we should not uh, also, uh, we should also keep in, uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, there are other parts of this uh, story of di digitalization and digital power in Estonia. For example, a couple of years ago, uh, Estonia was facing a huge money, uh, money laundry scandal. It basically involved uh, a local branch of uh, the Danish bank, Danske Bank. And uh, the story was basically about money that originated again from Russia and from other, some other post-Soviet countries. So in this sense, Again, uh, this only confirms our basic uh, uh, basic argument that territoriality and geo whatever location still matters. Uh, and of course, this was a very serious blow to uh, uh, the EU reputation because according to the report issued by the government, uh, uh, Estonian banks uh, had a large number of non-residence customers, which basically refers to this flip side of e-residency. Uh, e-residency program and starting from uh, the eruption of this scandal, many Estonian banks have drastically toughened their regulations when it comes to requirement for non-residents uh, uh, customers and uh, that was very detrimental to the whole idea of e-residency. At least that's uh, the, how, how the issue is uh, discussed in, uh, in Estonia. And there are other issues that we need to take into account. For example, according to the report of uh, Controller General of 2019, uh, two-thirds of Estonian hospitals consider 
the e-health system uh, suboptimal, uh, bothersome, and requiring further reorganization, etc. Uh, Estonia, according to the Digital Economy and Society Index, uh, was ranked only uh, seventh in uh, in the European Union, being outperformed by Finland, Sweden, Denmark. So basically, Nordic countries. So in this sense, uh, my point here is that. Uh, uh, the, the, the digital leadership is something that you need to invest uh, always in your resources. This is not something that you can uh, you can possess. It's not something that you you get forever. And I think Estonia is completely aware of that. Uh, now uh, the COVID nineteen uh, uh, thing, how it uh, changed uh, uh, this uh, this uh, 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 this perception of digital power and its operation. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, the COVID crisis uh, made clear that Estonia does have these digital uh, uh, advantages and the digital power does work. Uh, Estonia was one of the first countries who started uh, mobilizing uh, the initiative coming from civil society, from the community of IT uh, experts and specialists, uh, organizing uh, a couple of uh, hackathons including uh, the largest of uh, one, Hack the Crisis, which basically led to a set of proposals, and including technical solutions, how uh, the IT community can contribute to uh, combating, uh, combating uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, when it comes to the government, uh, it always, despite the fact that uh, we have an Estonian coalition government with uh, uh, some parties that are not liberal by their ideology, but in the meantime, the general approach of the government towards uh, issues of surveillance and control and collecting data from, uh, from citizens and residents was quite in line with, uh, with the liberal principles. And the government was always saying that uh, the more data we collect, uh, the earlier we can uh, lift all those you know, restrictions and come back to the normal life. So that, that's, that was the general uh, philosophy of uh, uh, of the government. Another point which is very important is the private, uh, the, uh, the public-private partnership, which is very well developed in Estonia. And the COVID-19 crisis became an, an important, uh, an important linchpin for kind of uh, strengthening this uh, this partnership. Uh, again, this brings us back to the idea of res responsabilization, like responsible behavior. This technology, I mean, including all these anti-COVID apps and applications they can be functional. And this is not only about Estonia, I think this is a general debate on that. They can be operational and functional only uh, in case of responsible uh, behavior of ordinary citizens, like uh, citizens that take care of their, uh, of their health, of the health of their families, of their relatives and their friends. So it's, it's, it's more about uh, kind of self-securing citizenship. The concept of, the, the whole concept of citizenship is changing. Uh, because of COVID, and it moves towards, uh, again, uh, more self-care uh, and more uh, responsibility that also includes telemedicine, uh, that also includes some minor things, like, for example, the self-opening of uh, notices of sick leave in Estonia that became a part of uh, the debate quite recently. By the way, in the brackets, I should mention that this, this is a very biopolitical issue. Uh, and... Uh, this also includes uh, new skills that should come from medical staff itself and uh, the initiative that medical staff should, uh, should demonstrate, not necessarily because the state mandates something and the state orders to do something, but because of the sense of professional uh, responsibility and there's a plenty of room for improvement in this direction in Estonia as in all other uh, countries. One of major political thinkers from the very beginning, I mentioned that uh, a digital power is something that is interesting to us basically because of its political characteristics. So one of the most interesting political effects of, of the digital power in Estonia is uh, uh, a, a new boost to the integration of Russian speakers into uh, the Estonian uh, mainstream politics. Liz already mentioned uh, in introducing Estonia that a sizable part of the population uh, comes from a uh, Russian cultural and linguistic background. 
and the issue of integration of uh, these Russophones, who are known as Soviet Thai migrants in Estonia, was always very sharp and acute. And now, with this kind of IT generation in Estonia, and there is a debate on that, all well, the old issues of the Soviet occupation and the deportations, etc., they might become less divisive and less, uh, you know, uh, less important in the agenda. And uh, uh, when it comes to the media, including the uh, the, the, the electronic media, uh, while well, uh, uh, we know that uh, the Russian-speaking audience, starting from the COVID, uh, the, the the beginning of the COVID crisis, became much more interested in Estonian news rather than in Russian news, because Russia is just a neighboring country, and when it comes to your health, when it comes to your personal biopolitics, well, what matters is the state of affairs with the local uh, local medicine, uh, the state of affairs with the with, with the local government, much more than uh, all this kind of information related to Russia. So this is what we really need to keep in mind: this integrative, you know, potential of uh, the uh, the anti-COVID measure for integrating Russian speakers. Well, there are two the flip uh, sides and two, uh, let's say, critical points that I would like to mention just for, for the sake of balance. Uh, the first is the, the issue of governance. I have mentioned already that one third of the uh, ministerial uh, positions belong to party named ECRE, uh, which is a populist conservative nationalist party, which is EU skeptic and in many respects anti uh, place on the anti-globalization uh, flank. And uh, uh, in, in Estonian media, uh, a couple of incidents were um, uh, discussed. For example, a previous minister of IT uh, in the Estonian government refused to speak English, for example, uh, because basically uh, she came from, from this uh, populist conservative party. And uh, the, the IT minister during, I mean, at the very peak of the COVID crisis had to resign. Uh, because of his disagreements with his own party. So that basically uh, kind of underscores uh, some issues related to, to, to governance, especially when it comes to the IT, IT sector. But in the meantime, it also, uh, it also confirms uh, our, uh, our argument that uh, the state of civil society and the level of responsi responsibility within civil society is as important as uh, um, uh, as, as governance. And uh, yeah, so I would uh, probably stop here and uh, uh, please, the floor is again yours. Thank you, Andre. I'm just going to make a very few concluding remarks and then we'll turn it over to questions where we're going to hear your questions and comments. So just to conclude our presentation, uh, we argue that COVID-19 has reframed vulnerability for Taiwan and Estonia uh, due to uh, digital power, both in terms of their own understanding of its value in combating the pandemic and in global awareness of this digital power. And uh, there are two sets of issues uh, that emerge. One has to do with the role of sovereignty. Um, and one surprising conclusion is that while we, well, we usually think of digital power um, uh, heightening globalization, which challenges state sovereignty. In this case, we found that digital power actually expands state sovereignty uh, for both Estonia and Taiwan. Um, as uh, Andre was mentioning, um, the COVID crisis helped facilitate the, the integration of Russian speakers uh, within Estonia's community. And that was always the leverage that Russia had in Estonia, it was this supposedly disaffected Russian community. And so to the extent that the crisis helped better integrate them into the information space in Estonia, where they would be less subject to Russian disinformation and helped create a sense of national purpose and, and solidarity, this reinforces Estonian, uh, Estonian uh, sovereignty. In Taiwan, the situation is a bit different. Uh, Taiwan has, has uh, achieved greater soft power because of its, its 
handling of the crisis without um, as draconian methods. And this uh, success has coincided with a boost in U.S.-Taiwan relations. We just saw the Secretary of Health and Human Services from the U.S. visit Taiwan, an uh, uh, unprecedented move. Uh, although I would say this is connected more to Trump's China policy than to think whatever's happening in Taiwan. But nonetheless, this soft power, I think, expands Taiwan's diplomatic space, even as the, the PRC is trying to restrict it, preventing it, of course, from participating in the WHO. And this expanded diplomatic space also reinforces Taiwan's identity. Uh, so, so we have, it has an impact on Taiwan's uh, sovereignty. On the other hand, it exacerbates geopolitical pressures from China. And we see uh, a lot of, uh, uh, intrusions by PRC military in Taiwan's airspace recently, big exercises planned for all, for this month in terms of, uh, that will rehearse retaking uh, an island from Taiwan. Um, so, so there's some pushback there um, in terms of this expansion of sovereignty. Uh, the second issues that we that we see raised has to do with the vulnerabilities. Uh, of democracies and the success of authoritarian states. Is it, going back to what Andre said earlier about how we typically look um, at cyberspace as an arena for competition between authoritarian and, dem and democratic regimes. And so we, although there was some pushback in Estonia and Taiwan on the digital responses for different reasons, uh, generally we saw consensus prevailing in both and a greater sense of solidarity and encouraging more responsibility by citizens using these digital tools. And because the digital tools were used effectively by citizens and companies and others, there was no need for a draconian lockdowns in, in Taiwan or Estonia. We saw uh, tech communities and individuals taking steps that obviated the need for such steps. And so here we see biopower is usually thought of as the imposition of state of government measures to, on behalf of the health of the people. But here we saw society taking a role in protecting its own biopower. And a final word is that we see that democracies use digital tools differently than authoritarian states. And the aim of the digital tools in Estonia and Taiwan was to empower society to play a role in protecting themselves not uh, to surrender um, their own autonomy to the government to take actions on their behalf in this pandemic. So I'll stop there and look forward to comments and questions. Thanks very much to both of you for those interesting uh, <coughs> presentations. And the folks who are listening, please submit your questions on the Facebook comment function. I want to ask a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> so, and my first question to both of you is, what was the goal vis-a-vis -vis COVID in particular of the disinformation campaign from the big neighbor? So with respect to Taiwan, which I know a little bit more about, as I think about this, I know there's uh, a lot of, uh, I know that the, the DPP government in Taiwan is very, has made a lot of publicity about the fact that they are threatened by cyber hacking from the mainland. And I don't think I know, however, exactly what the mainland has done. I assume they've uh, tried to um, discredit DPP politicians. Maybe they've tried to help the KMT and the new party. But in, with respect to COVID, I have no idea what China's message has been. Uh, you know, I know that in Africa, for example, their message is we're sending masks, we're helping you, but, but they're not doing that to Taiwan. So what is their info, you know, info exercise in Taiwan with respect to COVID? And then in, in Estonia as well, what are the goals of Russian disinformation operations there, I assume that, and this I don't know, but I assume that Russia wants to discredit NATO, for example, and the United States and all that. But when it comes to COVID, what is their pitch? And for Andre, I want to add 
make that question a little bit more complicated by asking him to put Estonia in the context of the other Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia. Uh, is it different? Is it the same with respect to my narrow question about Russian goals and, and, and also with respect to the big picture that he painted of being advanced in a digital way. So let's start with Liz and then go to Andre. Uh, that's, that's a great question about the uh, Chinese disinformation during COVID. And so it had so, some similarities to what we experienced in terms of the origins of COVID that uh, not, not in China, in the US and so on. So certain common themes there. But one specific theme to Taiwan was that the government of Taiwan was not telling people the true picture about COVID in Taiwan, that there were more cases, that things were not as going as well as, it, as they thought um, to try to undermine confidence in, in the Taiwan uh, government's response. So I think that was the, the overarching purpose. Well, when it comes to Russia, well, let me start with a more general picture, because Russia tried to use uh, the COVID crisis, especially in Italy, for uh, re, how should I say, uh, for changing its bad image in the West, including in uh, NATO countries. And uh, Russia has sent, by the request of Italian government, at the very peak of uh, the crisis, it's a uh, uh, health diplomacy mission or kind of humanitarian convoy, which was not humanitarian, uh, basically, but it uh, was uh, 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 based on the resources provided by uh, Defense Ministry. And that was a hugest, uh, uh, I would say, foreign policy PR campaign for Russia during <clears throat> the whole uh, pandemic, but it has nothing to do with Baltic state. So what it, that was basically about Italy and uh, about uh, uh, Serbia. Uh, Russia tried just, uh, that's what I uh, once uh, uh, read in, uh, local, in local media, that Russia once uh, uh, tried uh, quite uh, unsuccessfully to uh, present itself as a helper to Estonia, uh, allegedly saying that a, a huge, uh, uh, you know, a huge uh, amount of masks have been uh, delivered to Estonian state, which was not the case. And Estonian state just, uh, I think, made it uh, terrification that this is not this is not true. Uh, when it comes to the Russian, because I, in Estonia the specificity of this Russian uh, language or Russian whatever uh, Russian propaganda uh, is basically an important factor for Russian-speaking community. Estonians, I mean, as ethnic Estonians, they are relatively immune to the Russian propaganda because they have an experience and that would be very hard to, uh, you know, invent something that would change minds of, uh, you know, ethnic Estonians when it comes to Russia. But when it comes to Russian speakers, of course, the situation is different. And uh, I think my major concern is that uh, people who were listening to the Russian uh, TV channels and living in Estonia, for example, in the city of Narva, which is 95% uh, uh, Russian by you know, language and uh, cultural background, well, they might have received very different and very, uh, I would say, misleading messages. They might receive messages from those uh, uh, journalists and public speakers who would support the idea of herd immunity, which basically means uh, the more in, in fact we have, the sooner we'll get rid of this, uh, of this virus. And in the meantime, uh, they could have received a message from uh, this, would, I would call them super securitizers, who would say, no, no, this is really a serious security issue. Look at what's going on in the States. Look at what, what is going on in, in Italy uh, and in other countries. So we should be really prepared and we should take really serious measures. So I don't think that this is a part of propaganda. I think this is a part of uh, everyday coverage of this issue in a very controversial way uh, in Russia. So uh, the effect of this, uh, uh, let's say, very mixed uh, type of discourse could be, uh, you know, uh, 
very, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, very, uh, very mixed picture generally. Uh, what uh, has to be done and uh, whether they should take seriously uh, the COVID uh, challenge. But in the meantime, again, let me just repeat that uh, the level of interest Russian uh, TV channels in Estonia among Russian speakers is falling, is dropping. And uh, that's uh, one of the factors that uh, might, uh, you know, uh, be uh, uh, considered as uh, you know good news. And concerning the three Baltic states, yes, basically uh, the situation with uh, well, first of all, the situation with the with the pandemic as such was very similar in uh, three uh, Baltic states, and in Finland, by the way. Uh, I think uh, important factor was that the three Baltic states have been coordinating among themselves in this uh, uh, triangle, uh, the reopening of borders, uh, because, because of uh, similarity of uh, the pandemic situation on the ground. And I think this is a very interesting ex experience within the EU of three countries uh, being able to reach consensus when it comes to you know, coming back to the normal, uh, in times when the European Union uh, as such was still, you know, very uncertain, to say the least, how to tackle the crisis uh, and how to, uh, how to lift all these um, restrictions and new uh, regulations. So that's, uh, that's also good news. Are all of those Baltic states equally digitized? Well, it depends on how you measure it. Well, I think Estonia is a little bit ahead of uh, two other countries, but it, 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 it depends on what you, uh, what, what exactly and, and how you calculate. I don't think there is one single measurement that would uh, enable us to rank them in, uh, let's say, uncontroversial way. But Estonia is known generally, and this is basically perception, this is because Estonia maybe invested more in uh, this, uh, you know, digital sphere, and Estonia may it's uh, digitalization, a part of, as I mentioned already, nation branding uh, campaign. I think Estonia might be a little bit uh, uh, more, uh, let's say, experienced in that. But uh, the distinction is not that drastic. We have a question from Ian Zellinger, which is, how does hyper-digitization play with the growth of inequality? I think meaning that uh, as these two societies become more and more digitized, there are some people left behind who, who don't get to participate. So why don't we start with, uh, with Andre, since you know, you're up there on the screen anyway. <laughs> you, you, you need to unmute yourself, you're still muted. Oh, sorry. Um, uh... Yeah, I have mentioned that uh, very briefly as a part of the, of, of the uh, let's say, nascent or incipient academic uh, debate on uh, the, the possible uh, social or societal effects of, uh, of, of COVID. Uh, exactly. I mean, this digital way of life is basically uh, something uh, that is uh, uh, well taken by younger generation, and that might create a kind of... Uh, 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 kind of disequilibrium uh, when it comes to the age factor. It also uh, might be uh, a factor that might uh, uh, differentiate the urban lifestyle from the rural uh, lifestyle, and that might be uh, an exacerbating factor. But this is still very, I would say, uh, very hypothetical. We don't have data on that. We just have a feeling that this is something that we need to keep an eye on. Plus, of course, in those countries that have a very large uh, percentage of uh, migrant uh, population and immigrant communities, that also might be uh, considered as, uh, as, 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 a, as, as, as a factor. And the access to, uh, to the internet and the access to the, all, all those digital services among, uh, uh, let's say, non-local population might be lower. Uh, and that's what uh, sociologists definitely need to uh, need to keep in mind. Uh, speaking about these new <coughs> new inequalities that might be created by di digitalization. Liz, would you like to address that? Yes, 
I, I think age is, is, an, is an interesting point. And um, there, there were some concerns in Taiwan about the impact on privacy of all of this data amalgamation by authorities and even the, the uh, voluntary uh, relinquishing of data by citizens to, to um, self-quarantine or uh, to um, otherwise participate in the effort. And there was a study that showed that, um, that respondents under 29 were much less concerned about privacy than older respondents. And uh, I think that reflects different historical experiences with Taiwan, the, the, um, le the period of white terror being less uh, relevant to younger population and so on. So there are different uh, generational differences, generational divides in this. Um, but Taiwan is, is highly penetrated by uh, social media and digital platforms. Um, like instead of Facebook, people use a platform called Line and the figures I saw that it attracts 90% of the population. So that's, that's a pretty high level of penetration, but who are those 10% that are not online? Because LINE was a way that the government uh, would disseminate information about the pandemic and what to do, and also uh, where that gender mob bot uh, that was uh, rebutting COVID-related disinformation, where you would find that. Uh, so this might be an urban-rural difference. There may be minorities who are not as well included. And the issue of migrant workers, I haven't really seen studied in terms of Taiwan, which also has migrant workers. That was a big problem for Singapore, for example, where you had pockets of outbreaks in migrant uh, communities. Um, and so I think that's something that, that we all need to pay attention to. Um, beneath the surface of these success stories that there may be marginalized populations that are not included in this um, overall success. If I can make just uh, one more comment uh, on, yeah. on that, because I think uh, this question might be uh, an interesting bridge to another uh, very interesting discussion on how uh, the COVID uh, crisis is related to a widely discussed issue of populism on a global scale. And I think those countries uh, heavily affected by populism, especially the right-wing populism. Uh, and we know that these populists are notoriously known for creating uh, divisions within societies, right? And pointing to others as kind of not belonging on being problematic, including the so-called domestic others. Uh, I'm, I mean, not only Estonia, because we do have our own uh, uh, conservative or right-wing populist, but it's also Poland, it's also Hungary, uh, and these countries. So these countries, they are m much more vulnerable to uh, this type of uh, populist technique of uh, uh, dividing populations into different categories, these who are kind of uh, belonging and these who are not belonging. Well, in, in case of Estonia, I can just mention a couple of uh, debates that we have here. One is a, a debate on uh, uh, foreign students, because uh, we are approaching the start of a new academic year. And uh, one of the universities uh, decided to, uh, well, de facto ex matriculate a certain number of foreign students from non-EU countries. Uh, as allegedly, you know, being a problematic category for, you know, for, for, for studies. And it uh, uh, created a, a background for a very, I would say, a heated discussion in the media. And the second uh, debate that we have is on uh, seasonal workers from Ukraine, uh, which uh, basically are treated as a kind of a seasonal uh, migrant uh, labor force uh, with all these, uh, you know, elements of uh, othering and uh, distancing uh, and uh, even isolating them. Uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, the different categories and uh, different, uh, let's say, hierarchies of uh, their status and their rights and their uh, forms of belonging or not belonging to the community. <clears throat> Thank you. We have a question from William Lin. What are the thoughts on Taiwan's digital minister post, which is currently held by Audrey Tang? It's an unelected position, he, William believes, 
but may be a more influential position than can be viewed on surface level? Is it an increasingly important role going forward? And is that position a good idea for countries like the United States? I guess that goes to Liz. Um, uh, for Taiwan, I think it's, a very, it's an interesting development. And as I mentioned, Audrey Tang, who is the digital minister, emerged out of the tech collective that developed um, at the time of the Sunflower Movement. And um, she, she's quite an interesting figure who believes that uh, digitalization um, is very much an integral part about, of Taiwan's democratization. Um, and so the purpose is to empower citizens to participate in governance by creating platforms uh, for them to discuss controversial issues. So uh, one of the controversies in Taiwan is about creating an EID that would amalgamate all kinds of databases and citizens would have one ID card that they would use for all of these different transactions. And it, would, it creates a lot of anxiety about privacy. It was supposed to be finished um, in three years and now it's not clear. Um, and so, um, the tech collective that uh, this minister was a part of has suggested that citizens could discuss this uh, initiative uh, uh, through uh, various online uh, platforms so they could uh, achieve a degree of social consensus. And, th and this is related to the previous question, your previous question, Andy, about disinformation, because I think um, PRC disinformation efforts are directed at creating division within Taiwan society. And so this, these digital tools and the position of the digital minister is designed to, to um, create greater consensus and to, instead of having, the model is instead of using cyberspace as a, as a divisive um, domain, the way it is in the United States, to, to use it to facilitate uh, building greater consensus. And so the way these platforms are set up is to avoid extreme points of view and to facilitate this kind of consensus building. And um, so, you know, most uh, ministers of government, I mean, uh, minister in, in the United States, I mean, the, the secretaries of departments are not elected. So from from our point of view, I mean, the, having an unelected uh, uh, department head is not a, a big uh, a big controversy. But in, in Taiwan system, I see the, I see where the question is coming from. But but uh, this minister um, has also uh, tried to create participation officers and other ministries to try to encourage dialogue uh, with the population. So perhaps the the post itself was not created uh, on the on the desire in the desired way, but the the purpose of it, according to this minister, is to create more um, opportunities for social consensus. I want to uh, throw a big fat double question to both of you. Uh, you both struck strong notes of optimism about two things. So Liz, you were optimistic about digital democracy. And in your remarks just now, you uh, struck that theme again. Um, and you drew a distinction between digital democracy and digital authoritarianism. And I find that a very difficult distinction. Uh, and even in your own remarks, you're pointing to the concern over privacy and so on. So uh, now, uh, Andre didn't, didn't uh, make this point, but I want to also ask him the same question. So my question about digital democracy is, is it really any different from digital authoritarianism? So in China, where the digital governance is pretty well developed, they have e-governance, they have uh, digitized uh, identification, they use digital surveillance for public health purposes. They use digital participation in various forms to make citizens feel that they're engaged and listened to. There are 
websites where citizens can go on and submit their complaints and their demands and and the the uh, these are answered by personnel and so on and so forth. So I want to believe that there's a difference, but living in the United States in the age of Facebook and so on and so forth, where we're worried, as you know, Liz, about, about whether we actually are drifting into digital authority. Is there really a, a, a difference between these two things? Uh, because the, the, the mainland form of digital authoritarian is rather participatory and it, 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 creates consensus and so on and so forth. So that's my first big fat ugly question. The second big fat ugly question has to do with the note of optimism that both of you struck. Um, I think Andre put it at the beginning of his remarks that the digital power of these two small countries does something to rectify the power imbalance and Liz, you used language about digital power expanding sovereignty, which I take to be a similar point. Uh, but about this, I have, I, ha I feel skeptical uh, because for one reason, it's my understanding that in the digital realm, the defense la lags behind the offense. The offense can always you know, whatever you do to defend yourself, they get around it. Um, and it certainly, again, from a, an American perspective, we seem to be constantly losing. Um, is, is that true? Uh, do these small countries use their digital power to counterattack China and Russia with whatever it is, I don't know. And you, this may be something that you guys can't answer because it might be a secret, but are they conducting information campaigns back against their rivals? So really it's a two part question. Can the defense ever win? And secondly, is there a counterattack in the digital sphere that we may know about? And I guess, um, I don't know who wants to, to, to answer first. You, you guys can decide. Liz, do you want to? Uh, I agree that I, I presented more of the uh, optimistic side of this. Of course, Taiwan's uh, human rights activists uh, present a lot of concerns about whether or not um, a state of exception has been identified in Taiwan, uh, like a time frame for how much data can be collected, how long this is going to happen. Do citizens have some form of redress if they feel that they're unfairly quarantined or if uh, their data is misused? Is there adequate legislation governing uh, the use of this data? Um, uh, is there bias in the, in the use of data? I mean, there are a lot of questions that activists raise about, about this use of data. So I, what I was trying to portray is that the digital tools contributed to the success of a successful handling of the pandemic. And so I'm, I, I think that, that that is a positive, generally a positive story in terms of the very low level of of uh, deaths and uh, cases in Taiwan compared to expectations, certainly by our own experience, it's, it's just, I mean, they did a terrific job. Um, it, is it, is, are the tools that Taiwan use different from, from uh, China's tools set? What's different is that Taiwan never had mandatory lockdowns. They didn't have, um, restrictions on how many people could leave the house, even people who are not being quarantined. You know, only one person from a household could leave every couple of days in, in various towns. And so, so the degree of social control was much greater on the mainland. You also had censorship in the mainland where a certain story is being presented and citizens uh, have difficulty Going, uh, going through this story and finding alternatives because of the Great Firewall um, and um, restrictions that, as you know very well, have been increasing under Xi Jinping. 
I think people in the mainland are not participating um, in the political sphere using these cyber tools. They're being mobilized. And for example, party members have to log into an app and read Xi Jinping's latest speech, and they get social credits for doing that. I mean, that's a mobilization tool. That's not a voluntary, maybe some people want to read his speech, but I, I don't know that everyone, every party member wants to, to do that on a daily basis. And you can't really criticize uh, the government uh, re response. And, and they tolerated some criticism on social media for a time, and then people were finding repercussions to that, uh, to that line of thinking. So I, so I think that the information space is different in Taiwan. And the um, bottom-up tech collective mentality that has cooperated with the, the Taiwan's government has had it its uh, as one of its purpose to encourage citizen participation and problem solving um, and not to wait for a top-down response. Um, so so the people do give up privacy in Taiwan, but they are participants in the process rather than subjects of the process as they are more or less in the mainland. I mean, people do participate in social media and e-commerce, but I don't think that they're the same space for participatory government um, there. So I guess I'm, I mean, my note of caution is on the privacy implications because at a certain stage, so much data is accumulated, you have to assume that the government has the interests of the people uh, in mind. And what if there's a different government in Taiwan that won't have the same um, approach, and that's what older uh, citizens who remember authoritarianism in Taiwan are concerned about, and uh, human rights activists and other privacy activists. Um, can uh, can a, um, a small democracy mount an adequate defense against a larger disinformation opponent? Um, I think that the the defense that Taiwan has mounted has been in the power of its example, in the soft power sphere. That it did successfully combat the pandemic, at least so far. And so it doesn't need the apparatus that, of the Chinese state because other people are well, other countries, other people are well aware of this example. And I think that's a frustration for the mainland where they try to use disinformation to upsell the PRC's response, Taiwan doesn't have to do that because other people, other countries um, have been recognizing that. So there's the power of example. And I think there also is some, uh, in some instances of hacking, there's tit for tat, there's retribution um, in the mainland by Taiwanese also. Um, but of course, that's less well documented. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Andre, we're very close to running out of time. So give, give, uh, Two minutes. Short answer. Okay, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, the question that you raised is really uh, important, uh, and I tend to agree with you that yes, in fact, in uh, this cyber slash digital domain, the distinction between democracy and non-democracy might be even less uh, certain and less definable than in, let's say, uh, uh, institutional or uh, other uh, spheres. But I still think that this distinction does exist. And uh, when we speak about uh, digital authoritarianism, well, this model should be based on, or should be presumed on the existence of some, some kind of you know, political subject that would be interested in uh, imposing all those regulations and uh, uh, collecting information that might be used uh, not, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in, in a positive, in a good sense for the whole, uh, for the whole society. And uh, in, in, in case like Estonia, for example, I don't think that this political subject exists because political class is very fragmented, it's uh, decentralized, and we do have checks and balances in, uh, in this country. And, uh, you know, what I have noticed, and I think it's quite interesting, the demands for toughening the regulations and for introducing stricter measures against COVID 
came not from the government, but they came from uh, some kind of civil society organizations like concerned citizens who demanded the government to be you know, more serious, more insistent, and impose new, me new measures, and from doctors, from professional, uh, professional, uh, professional medics, who pushed the governments to be tougher and to be more like, you know, uh, well, to some extent, more authoritarian. And the government uh, uh, resisted because the government did not have an, an, did not have intention to be more authoritarian, and it did not have resources for uh, for doing so. So, in this sense, I think uh, uh, digital democracy as a concept uh, does exist, and it, uh, it, it it presupposes it it, it implies some kind of procedures. And that's what we have in these small democracies. Uh, even if, uh, let's say, problematic from the viewpoint of uh, uh, you know, liberal understanding of politics, parties are in the government, we still have procedures. And we still have rules that might uh, you know, help to somehow overrule the decisions taken uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, in, in some spheres that might be not in full compliance with uh, um, uh, with the principle of democracy, and we should have public trust. And I think public trust is uh, uh, very important uh, for digital democracy. But the function of the police, uh, if you if you compare Estonia and Russia, and this is what can be easily visualized if you go to YouTube and you just watch the way how the police operates in Russia and how police operates in Estonia. And believe me, that would be two different universes. And uh, I, I don't see how they might, you know, uh, remain uh, unnoticed. Concerning counterattacks, well, basically the answer is no, uh, because in Estonia we, we do have a NATO cyber center, cyber security center, that is a NATO uh, in, in institution, but it's basically protecting Estonia against the possible, uh, possible uh, cyber uh, incursions, and of course, uh, Estonian government, as any other government that is, uh, you know, bordering on Russia, they are interested in, you know, knowing what is going on there because it's uh, it, it is important in terms of uh, environmental security. Uh, it is important also in terms of uh, military security. But this is uh, basically a protective uh, protective model because I think uh, the uh, the gist and the crux of Estonian policy is first of all to develop uh, policies that would differentiate Estonia from Russia. Uh, and uh, to somehow detach Estonians from any attempts to, you know, impose this sphere of influence and uh, this type of geopolitical uh, mechanisms that have been very detrimental to Estonian uh, independence in uh, previous uh, uh, decades, if not centuries. <clears throat> well, thanks to both of you for a very interesting discussion. We're out of time. Thanks to the audience who listened on Facebook and were surveilled by Facebook and had all their data scooped up by Facebook. Um, it was a great uh, meeting you, Andre, and seeing you, Liz, and uh, hope to see you both again. And so we will end it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution to the discussion and for being a great moderator. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for great questions, which will help us as we refine our article. Absolutely. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you.